Well, hey there, I thought you'd come back again. Thomas Kissinger here, and this is going to be the tension in creation part two. This is a chapter out of the book written by Dr. Stephen Jones, Creation's Jubilee. And let's jump right back in where we left off last time. And this section is entitled Justice and Liability for Evil. The justice of God has been a matter of philosophical debate for thousands of years. In fact, all religions must deal with this question sooner or later. What is the origin of evil? What is its purpose? How will it end? Is there really justice with God? Some even question the existence of God on the grounds that if there were really a God, why would he allow all these wars and other terrible things to happen? Each religion's solution to these age-old problems gives character to its own particular God. We have already raised questions about the justice of the God of the Bible in view of the things he does by his own sovereign will or plan. Recall that Paul, too, questioned God's righteousness in dealing with Pharaoh in Romans chapter 9, verse 14. Every time we talk about Esau, Pharaoh, or others, who seem to have been treated unjustly, we raise the level of tension that must be resolved. And that is the purpose of this final section of our study. The real underlying question that we must deal with is the liability for sin. How liable is man for his sin? And if you remember, those of you who went through the series with me, um, Free Will versus Ownership, you know that we brought out in that series that it wasn't so much about whether man has this great big free will and this free moral agency, which he doesn't. But the biggest issue, the real issue was ownership and liability and what that says about God since he is the creator and owner of all things. So how liable is man for his sin? How liable is God for his actions in subjecting the creation to bondage of corruption? God always assumes full responsibility for all of his actions, and of course, man must follow his example. Man always resists God's will, and the Greek word is thelema. But Paul says that no man can resist God's plan. The Greek word is bulema. Remember, we also went over that before. Thelema and bulema. The will of God versus the plan of God or the higher purpose and intention of God. Yet before we can understand this question in any depth, we must define our terms. The definition of sin. Man sins because he is mortal. He is mortal because God made him liable for the original sin of his father, Adam. Therefore, God is the direct cause of man's weak, mortal condition and the indirect cause of his personal sins. The question is, does this make God a sinner? We immediately answer, no. Is God liable in any way for man's sin? We immediately answer, yes. This is one reason why he made himself liable for our sin through Jesus Christ and then paid the penalty for sin. We do not agree that this makes God a sinner, but only that he has made himself ultimately liable by his own law. To prove this, we must first look at the meaning of the word that is translated sin in the scriptures. The Hebrew word for sin is kotal. It is translated sin in over 400 Bible passages, yet the word literally means to miss the mark or to fail to reach a goal. In the physical sense, the word can be used in the case of an archer whose arrow misses the target. Judges 20.16 gives us another example. Out of all these people, 700 choice men were left-handed. Each one could sling a stone at a hair and not miss. And that word miss is the word kotal, to sin or miss. In the moral sense, the target goal or standard is the divine law, 1 John 3, 4. Any transgression of the law is sin. 
because the law is God's standard of righteousness. A sinner is one who has fallen short of perfection as defined in the law. Paul alludes to this meaning when he writes in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The glory of God here is the target. We have all fallen short of the target, failing to attain to that perfect goal. Essentially, then, sin is a failure to reach a particular goal. Now, remember that statement, okay? I'm going to hit on that again in a minute. Sin is a failure to reach a particular goal. Now, God created his own goal. Here we go. To create the universe, to allow man to fall into death and sin, and then to reconcile creation with justice and grace. To teach us justice, it was necessary for man to fall into sin. To implement grace, God needed sinners as the objects of grace. And so we ask ourselves, will God fail to carry out his plan? Must he reach for plan B? So many times I have heard those in the camp of Armenianism say, literally say, heard these words come out of their mouth. Well, this is not God's original plan that we're in right now. He never meant for it to be this way. Oh, really? So you mean God had a plan and it failed and now he's scrambling trying to put things back together, hoping for a good outcome, waiting to see what's going to happen. I don't believe that. The scriptures don't teach that. This is God's original plan. But what you have to see is come to terms with the fact that the fall was part of God's plan for mankind. And that's why Jesus was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. God knew the fall was going to happen, had factored it into his plan. It was part of his plan. And that's why Jesus was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. God already had the solution for it. Once again, and so we ask ourselves, will God fail to carry out his plan? Must he reach for plan B? If so, then God is a failure, hence a sinner. Wow. In Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive, every man in his own order. Everything goes down in Adam, universally. If everything is not brought back universally in Jesus Christ, God is a failure and a sinner. And he set out on a journey, and he set out on a goal, and he set out with a plan, and he failed. You have to see this modern-day evangelical Christianity. There's a disconnect. Most of modern-day evangelical Christianity is teaching that God is a failure, and they don't even realize it. They're teaching that Adam brought everything down, but Jesus Christ does not have the power, love, wisdom to bring everything back. But God is not a sinner, nor is he a failure. Nothing took him by surprise, for he foreknew all things. Nothing was out of control, even for a split second, for God is all-powerful. we got to see that. God is all-powerful. This is going completely according to his bulema, his plan, right? The Greek word bulema means his higher intention or his plan. So, from the beginning, it was in God's plan to create a temporary injustice and to spread it out on a finite timeline, which we call history. God has created temporary injustice. He has subjected all to disobedience that he might have mercy on all. Remember that? Many people unknowingly accuse God of being a sinner because they have not been taught the simple biblical definition of sin. As children, we learned the chorus, Jesus never fails. And often this motto is portrayed upon the walls of Christian homes. But when we grow older, we often are taught that Satan and men have the ability to thwart God's plan and purpose for creation. God wrings his hands in despair like a helpless giant in the sky. That's what most of Christianity teaches. God is wringing his hands in despair like a helpless giant in the sky. He's this helpless gentleman that can't do anything to bring back what has been lost. But the scriptures say 
that Jesus came to seek and save that which was lost. So they say, God wrings his hands in despair like a helpless giant in the sky, loudly complaining about man's condition, but fully bound by the law of free will to do anything about it. Boy, they preach that free will, don't they? That free moral agency. They say that's more powerful than the God who created the will himself. Ridiculous. Ridiculous. Go back and listen to my teaching on free will versus ownership. Plan after plan fails, and so God is thought to be changing plans constantly in an attempt to salvage as much as he can out of this world mess before he is forced to destroy nearly everything. Satan is said to win perhaps 90 to 99% of the world, but somehow God is given the victor's wreath. You got to see that modern day Christianity. You cannot have your cake and eat it too. You can't say God is all loving, all powerful, all wise, all knowing, wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, the prince of peace, almighty God, but yet he loses 95 to 99% of the human race and sets them on fire and burns them and tortures them forever or annihilates them. Uh-uh. You can't say that. So while God is so often portrayed as an all-powerful but helpless giant, the devil is portrayed as being nearly as powerful as God himself. But his advantage is that he cares nothing about man's free will. He is said to have a free hand in manipulating and causing men to sin in ways that God could never do to establish righteousness. In the way many Christians have been taught to view these age-old questions, Satan seems to fail far less than God does. <laughs> and finally, when it is all over, Satan wins with 99% of mankind while God is left with a paltry 1 to 10% of creation with which to populate the kingdom of light. This was essentially the position of Augustine in his city of God where history ends with a final separation of light and darkness, with Satan being a success and punished for it, while God is viewed as the sore loser, thus the sinner, the helpless giant who failed. Wow! Doc Jones lays it out there, doesn't he, baby? This view of both God and Satan has serious flaws that need to be rectified by some serious Bible study. We've got to get this. We've got to get a revelation of this and understand that God has a plan. He's in control. God has created this tension in creation, but he's going to resolve it. Because if he doesn't resolve it, then we would have to say the fall of man, the devil, sin, the powers of darkness, and the will of man are the ones who get crowned with the victory. And God is the helpless giant in the sky who ends as a sinner because he set out with a plan and he missed the mark. But our God, through Jesus Christ, does not miss the mark, but he's the Savior of the world. Hallelujah.